We are in a series through the book of Philippians, and we look at our message here this morning in chapter one of Philippians, living for the glory of God. If you have a Bible, you want to open to chapter one, verse 12 through 26, as we look at this message once again, living for the glory of God. When the Lord radically gets a hold of a human heart, we begin to have a relationship with him. And we discover that everything in our life we want to bring into that place of submission to his will. We want to live for his glory. We want to love him. We want to follow him. We want to serve him. And Paul the Apostle, years before he ever wrote these words here to the church in Philippi, had been radically saved from a life of sin and rebellion and his religiosity as he was on a road to Damascus to arrest Christians, to imprison Christians with letters from the high priest in Jerusalem to drag them kicking and screaming back to Jerusalem because Paul thought in his heart that he must destroy this thing called Christianity. But the Lord Jesus changed that one day when he met him on the road to Damascus and he falls down in this light that's brighter than the noonday sun shone from heaven and Jesus spoke from heaven to Paul's life. His name at that time was Saul of Tarsus. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Goads are those sharp sticks that farmers use. You know, we call them a cattle prod. Basically, that prod you along. And the Lord had been goading Paul. He had been poking Paul and driving him towards the things of the message of Jesus. But he was kicking and resisting and and having a hard time. And Paul asked two inquiries. Important questions. He said, First, who are you, Lord? He said, Jesus said from heaven, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. And then he said, What do you want me to do, Lord? Which is the second question all of us should ask once we meet Jesus. Okay, Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus. Okay, what do you want me to do now? He told him to go into town and the, it would be shown to him. Now, in this passage, Ananias was asked to go lay hands on Paul the apostle. And Paul said, I mean, Ananias has said, Hey, I've heard about this Saul guy. He's creating all kinds of problems, and you sure you want me to go lay hands on him? He says, it's all right. He, I'm going to show you. He, he's my chosen vessel to bear my name before Gentiles and Israel and kings, and I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. You see, that was many years before he wrote these words in front of us. And now commentators uh, kind of bounce around between 20 and 30 years of walking with Jesus. And this is what Paul wants to download in our hearts about living for the glory of God is that number one, it changes the way that we look at our circumstances. Number two, it changes the relationships and the dynamic, how people react to our lives. And number three, it changes how we view life and death. Now, these are all really important things because all of us are in different circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly of life on a consistent basis. So how do we view that from God's perspective? Other people are excited about our faith in the Lord and they're encouraged to move forward with their walk with God. But others are not so excited about us and they're really not a fan of what's going on in our life. But lastly, everybody needs to be ready for the most important day of your life. And that is the day that you step from this physical life into the eternal life and you face the God of the universe. So how does that um, affect our lives? What does that look like? Well, first of all, let's look at how it changes the way we look at circumstances. Look what Paul says here in verse 12 through 13. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Paul the Apostle says, hey, brethren, I want you guys to know something, that these turn of events that everybody in the church and people that know Paul are actually feeling bad for him, feeling sorry for him. He's arrested. He's in Rome in a a rented house, chained to a soldier, and that It starts with the soldiers because, uh, you know, most people say, oh, no, Paul's chained to a soldier all day long. I mean, he's always, always connected to these soldiers. And and you might feel bad for Paul, but I just have a different perspective. I feel bad for that soldier. You imagine being chained to Paul the Apostle day in and day out, hours at a time. All he wants to talk about is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Always talking to me about Jesus. I can't kill him. I can't shut him up, you know. And so 
all these guards are listening. Now, most believe this is the Praetorian Guard, which is the elite forces of Caesar, which are like the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, the Army Rangers of the Roman army. So these are bad dudes chained to Paul the Apostle, who is also a bad dude in his own right, as far as a mean, lean preaching machine. So Paul says, you know, these events, these turn of events have actually, I like the way it, it, they've actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, he says here. That things have turned around. There are people that are feeling bad for him. He's like, hey, don't feel bad for me. Check it out. I was arrested and now, but God's word is not arrested. God's word is not chained. I'm sharing it with the soldiers. And it says, now those in the, the uh, palace have actually heard about the gospel. Everybody knows this. Paul's not in jail or he's not arrested because he's a thief, or he's a murderer, or he's causing some kind of uh, public nuisance. Paul's in chains because he loves Jesus. That's why he's in jail. That's why he has chains on. Yes, amen, sister. Every... Everybody knows at this time why Paul is there. Now, so when you think about it today, <laughs> today we have a brother in the Lord that's over in Iran and he's in jail. His name's Saeed. His wife's name Nogme. Now, I, I've known Saeed and Nogme for years. We've ministered together at, uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, ministering to 122 pastors from Iran that our church had saved up basically a, a large mission budget as we did each year to reach the world for Christ. And ultimately, these Iranian Christians, um, they needed to have some encouragement. It was a very relatively new ministry. And, and so we had saved up all through the year, and, and the Lord really prompted our heart to help these Christians get out of Iran and come to a pastor's conference in Istanbul, Turkey. So we chartered a, a, a plane and brought these 122 people to um, Istanbul, Turkey. We had a great week of sharing the love of Jesus and the gospel, and we met Nag, uh, Saeed's mom and relatives and, and all kinds of things. And, and the Iranian people are a very passionate people. Like during the worship stuff, it's kind of cool. I love worshiping pe with people from other cultures because when the people got really excited in worship there, <laughs> when we were together, they're like, ay, 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 ay. Now, I think that would just be cool. You know, on a regular basis, just to do a cool Iranian, you know, whatever you call that thing. That's a, that's a praise the Lord on steroids is what that is, okay? But ultimately, for all these years, no one has known who Said and Nagme are, right? But then he gets arrested in Iran for the gospel's sake. Not for being a thief, not for causing some... Actually, he was uh, opening orphanages to share the love of Jesus with little children. That's what he was arrested for. And, and now the entire world knows. The entire world knows about Saeed's life and, and Nagme's life. And years ago, those who have been with us a long time, we had Saeed speak in our church when we were in the little sanctuary and hear his powerful testimony of what God had done in his life. Well, here's Paul the Apostle a couple of thousand years ago, same scenario. Now, there's not CNN and Fox News to carry it all over, but where it was really important, around the palace guard. He goes, I want you guys to know that God has taken these circumstances that the whole world would look at as a negative and God's turned them into a positive. You see, Romans 8.28 is true for all generations. For we know, for we know that God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. The Old Testament version of that is set, stated by Joseph in Genesis 50 when he looked at his brothers and he said, what you guys did to me, you meant for evil, but God used it for good. God meant it for good. That even when man does its worst, God can take man's worst and turn it into God's best. Now that is true of every circumstance in my life. There are a lot of people that really don't believe Romans 8.28. They would rewrite it this way. Well, we know that some things work together for the good of those who are, love God and are called according to his purpose. Or, you know, only those nice things. That's not so. When a child of God comes to the Lord by faith and you give him the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the hardship, and even your own sin and failure, and you lay it at Jesus' feet and say, Lord, I've just made a mess of things. I lay it at your feet. Help me, Lord, by your grace to change my life. Take this mess that I've made. And turn it into something beautiful, Lord. I don't know how you'll do that. But you alone can do that. You see, when you live for the glory of God, it changes your perspective on all of life. 
And you might be here today and, man, you're going through a rough time. You're going through a rough patch. You're going through a rough struggle. Wednesday night, a brother in the Lord that I've known for many years was sharing his heart with me. He said, you know, a few years ago I lost my house. And uh, he said, it's been one of the most humbling things that's ever happened to me in my life. He, I, I prided myself and I always pay my bills and he was very diligent. But because he had, took a job out of state and he tried to uh, pay the mortgage here for two years and there also. And he just got to the place that they were crippled financially and he had to finally give up. And he said, you know, I've just committed that to the Lord. I just said, Lord, I, I really... I've blown it or I've failed or whatever's happened and I just pray that you'll turn it for good. He was sharing with me now when he recently, his wife needed a car, so when he went in to talk about finances, you, there, there's that home foreclosure. And he said, you know how humbling it is to go in when you've spent your whole life paying all your bills? And you have to look at that guy and say, you know, this is what happened. I got behind, we, we got in trouble and he said, it is so humbling. And he said, I thank God for that. Now most of us wouldn't be thanking God for that. But he said, I thank God for what he's doing in my heart. And that the pride of my heart has been really broken. And that there's a humility now in my life because of my own, my own failure financially. You know, God can take things that this world and the devil, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and God can turn them and use them some, for something beautiful. Paul says, you know what, these circumstances have actually turned around for an opportunity that everybody knows that I'm in chains because the Son of God, who loves us, who died on a cross for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead, through faith in Him, you can have everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. So it's not only as you live a life that is giving glory to God, that we look at our circumstances differently. And I, I must confess that when I'm in a hard spot or between a rock and a hard spot, and I don't know what God's doing, I just, I just go, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. I trust you. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Secondly, if you're living for the glory of God, you're going to inspire some to be bolder in their faith for Jesus. And there will be others that are not so excited about who you are. They're not necessarily a fan of who you are. And you're going to have a few of those people in your life. Paul had them. I can't imagine. Paul the Apostle, who wrote half the New Testament, a bunch of preachers being out of sorts with this incredible servant of God. But it happens, doesn't it? Check it out in verse 13, uh, 14 through 18. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold. Notice that. Because of Paul's chains and imprisonment, they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Paul said, basically there's two camps among believers that have been impacted by his time in chains, that he is in prison, that he's waiting to stand before Caesar Nero. And there were those that they looked at Paul and go, look at Paul. He's not, he's not being quiet about his faith. He's chained up and he's preaching away. You know what? If he can do it, we can do it. Let's share Christ with our family. Let's share Christ with our coworkers. Let's share Christ with our neighbors. And because of Paul's shining example of boldness. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody really bold, but when you're around really bold people, it kind of spurs you on. Like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's share about our love relationship with Jesus. And so there's this group of Christians. It says in verse 14, and most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains. Most of them were impacted in a positive way by the courageous, heroic, selfless, amazing life transformation of the Apostle Paul as he lived a life that gave glory to God. Man, they were impacted. But then there's this other group. And you see they're not false teachers because Paul would have corrected that. They're actually pastors, teachers, other Christians. You know, they're just kind of rubbed the wrong way by Paul. They didn't really like his method. They didn't really like his message. They didn't really like he, who he was. You mean there are some people that don't like me? <laughs> you mean that I might 
try to be a friend to somebody on Facebook and I might be rejected? Oh, my. Oh, no. You mean I might be unfriended by somebody? And Paul the Apostle, he just states it like it is. He said, you know what? Most of the believers have become bold in their witness for Christ. But there is this group that they actually are kind of a thorn in my side. They preach because their motivation is selfish ambition, envy, and strife. That's what motivates them in ministry. And not only does it motivate them in ministry, but they think that they're going to basically add a burden to Paul. Like, yeah, look at Paul. He's in prison. He can't, his church isn't growing. He's in jail. We're over here preaching, and these people are getting saved, and this is going on. You see, there's a little thing in, among churches and pastors. i got to give you a little um, behind-the-scenes look at. Did you know preachers are competitive? Did you know that uh, pastors and churches can be competitive? They can be. And, oh, the Lord's had to deal with my heart over the years about my own competitiveness because, you see, I'm just wired for competition. If you and I play ping pong, my goal is to destroy you. <laughs> that is my goal. It's not that it's close. It's not that it's whatever. It's I'm going to win. And as soon as the contest is on, it's like the face changes, the smile goes on. <laughs> going to be competitive, right? When Tammy and I were first married back in 1986, we were living in Las Vegas, and we had never uh, played tennis. But the place where we lived had a tennis court. And so we bought a couple of rackets, you know, cheap Kmart rackets, and a couple of tennis balls. We, we went out there, and we started playing. But as soon as, I mean, how, it's a net, and how hard can it be? Right? So we started playing. But once I figured it out, I'm going to win. And here's my precious bride. We're newlyweds. Tammy's 19, and I'm 21. And I crushed her. <laughs> and, and she, Tammy also is very, very competitive. And she plays, plays sports and things. So it began, our first kind of sore spot in marriage was that I, I don't know how to back off. You know what I mean? I'm not going to back off. I'm going to win. And so I told her, I said, you know what? I'll play you left-handed. She goes, okay, I'll take you left-handed. But then I began to win left-handed. She stopped in the middle of the game. She says, wait. Are you using your left hand? I said, yes. That was the last time we've uh, really played much, any, shall we say, competitive tennis for the rest of our 27 years of married life? Because I'm competitive by nature. Why are pastors and churches competitive? Because by nature, usually pastors are driven guys that want to accomplish something for the kingdom. And so they have that chip, but when it's, it's twisted or it's perverted or it's not right, what happens is that, makes them in opposition to ever other pastors or other preachers. But this is the thing the Lord has to teach you. And I've been a pastor for 25 years. So in the early years, the Lord uh, took me to the woodshed and gave me a good spanking about all of this stuff. So I had the freedom to talk about it. And that is that the pastor across town or across the street or over here, they're not my competitor. They're my brother and we're in it together. It's a team thing. Now, you might say, I, I'm in opposition to the bartender. I'm in opposition to the drug dealer. I'm in opposition to the person that's teaching false things. I'm in opposition to those things because I want to stand for the Lord. But I'm not in opposition to other churches that believe God's word to be true and that Jesus is the Savior. I am not in opposition to that. And Paul the Apostle seems to be talking about Christians that are orthodox in nature because he does not correct for some kind of false teaching. So it's simply this. There's other preachers in town that really don't like Paul. I don't really care for him. That's shocking to me. All of us who are a fan, I'm a big fan of Paul's. I'm like, how can you not love Paul? I mean, look at the stuff of these. Well, you know, I've discovered that godly people sometimes get at odds with each other. I've discovered that people I disagree with, God blesses in spite of me. Right? That God's good. And so even, even as we are starting our prayer time this morning, before our church services, we pray together. And there's a couple of churches in town right now that are, that are looking for a pastor. So we just pray that the Lord would bless them with, you know, a, a pastor that's after God's own heart, that would be a great expositor to our community and to bring that revival to that local body, a couple of local churches. You see, I'm, we're not in competition with them. We're, we're all headed towards heaven. But there are some people that I know and love, but I've found out they don't care for me very much. And does that make me go sit in a corner and suck my thumb? <laughs> no. It's like, well, you know, 
Everybody's going to have their detractors. You're going to get sideways with people. Life, life's kind of messy, isn't it? Is life a bit messy? Now, if your life is all clean and, clean and neat and tidy and you don't have any messes, I just want you to know you're not doing anything <laughs> with your life. So anybody that is doing something, their life's messy. And I want you to know my life's very messy. <laughs> But it does my heart good. This is what I rejoice in, what Paul the Apostle and I learned this lesson from Philippians over all these years. That you know what? As long as somebody's preaching the good news of Jesus, I rejoice. I rejoice in them and what God is doing, and I celebrate. I celebrate that because, you see, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the judge. And our ministry here at Water Springs is is not the only church in town. We're just a part of the bigger body of Christ and what Jesus is doing in our community. And we want him to do a work of revival throughout the body of Christ, which there's lots of different names over the doors. But if we are his people, we want to be rejoicing with one another. And if the gospel's going forward, whether somebody doesn't like me or we've been at odds, I don't care. I just, hey, praise the Lord. May the gospel go forward. So, when we're living for the glory of God, what it does is it changes our perspective about our circumstances. That which seems negative, God can turn around for good. Also, our life is going to impact people so that they're more courageous for their faith. And other people are going to become detractors that are kind of thorns in our side. That's just life. So grow up and get over it. That's the way it is. Okay? Number three, living for the glory of God changes our perspective about the most important, all important issue of life and death. Look what Paul says, starting in verse 19 through 26. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul said, you know what, I, I believe I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to be delivered from my situation. Now, because of the context of how he tells us that he's going to be delivered, whether in this life or by death, tells us that Paul had embraced basically A and B of God delivering us. Most of us, when we want God to intervene in our circumstances, we pray that God will deliver us out of our circumstances, right? If you're in a difficult situation, you just want out of that difficult situation. Lord, deliver me from my uh, trial or adversity or struggle. That's plan A. I think every Christian prays that way first. Lord, please deliver me. Please deliver me now. Please deliver me before the first of the month so I don't have to pay rent. Lord, deliver me somehow. Right? So, but plan B is God says, yeah, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to give you the strength and grace to go through the storm, not deliver you out of the storm. That's plan B. I don't like that answer so much. How about you? I don't really like going through the hard stuff and the adversity and the struggles. Like, like deliver me out of this. And the Lord goes, no, I'm going to give you grace. You're, you're going to make it. You're going to go right through the storm. So what Paul is saying, you know, he, he tells the Philippians, he says, you guys, through your prayers for me and the supply of the Holy Spirit, God is going to bring deliverance, whatever the answer to your prayers and the leading of the Spirit is. And that is, I can be delivered out of this, meaning he could be set free from his chains, or he could be delivered through death. When I pray for somebody to be healed, you're praying for them basically two things. They've, they've got the terminal diagnosis, and you're praying for them, Lord, you are able to heal. You are a big God. Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And by your stripes, we are healed. There's spiritual healing. There's emotional healing. There's physical healing that is available through the supernatural power of Jesus' message. But sometimes the Lord chooses not to do that. Sometimes the Lord says, no, it's time to go home. So you're praying for someone that the Lord will heal and that he'll deliver from that sickness 
And we've watched the Lord heal. Over the years of ministry that I've been involved with, I've watched the Lord heal somebody supernaturally, and I've watched others go home to be with the Lord, very, just, just die. One Sunday morning years ago, as it says in James chapter 5, at the end of the service, the Bible says if there's any sick among you, uh, call for the elders of the church, and, and they'll anoint them with oil, and the prayer that is offered in faith will bring recovery of the sick. And if they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. And so at the end of a service years ago, these two ladies came up side by side. Not, they didn't even know each other. And we prayed for this gal, and there was about three or four of us, and we prayed for her. And she had a malignant brain tumor in the center of her brain that was inoperable, the size of a golf ball. And uh, she had just started chemo and uh, I think radiation. So we laid hands on her and we prayed for her. It was awesome. She went in for a checkup the next week. And it had shrank to the size of a pea and the doctors were blown away. They stopped chemo, they stopped radiation. They, they said, we don't know what happened. She's like, I know what happened. I went to church, they prayed for me. I said, boom. A few years ago, Tammy and I were in Twin Falls, our hometown, and uh, we were, uh, got a prescription through a drive through and, and there she was after all these years. That, hey, there's Vicki. But the gal right next to her had ovarian cancer. And we laid hands on her, and we anointed her, and we prayed for her just like we did, Vicki. And she was home with the Lord in three months. She had a little two-year-old girl, a little four-year-old girl, just the most adorable little blonde-haired girls you've ever seen in your life. The husband was the bass player in the worship team. Go figure. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't. Somebody has asked me, why does God heal some and not others? I don't have the foggiest except to know this. God can heal. He is able to heal. We pray that God heals. But when he chooses not to, we say his grace is sufficient because God can go deliver you out of that trial or he can deliver you through that trial. Because ultimately, when you die on this planet and Jesus is your Lord, you have been delivered. You have been healed with the ultimate healing for eternity. Now, Paul the Apostle lays out, I know you guys are praying for me, he tells the Philippians, through your prayers. And he said, my earnest expectation is it's this Greek word is the picture of you standing on your toes, straining your neck, just wanting to know what God's going to do. Have you ever felt that way? Like, oh, you're praying. You're like, Lord, what are you going to do? I'm just stretching out here to see what you're going to do. And so he tells us that uh, at the end of verse 20, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul states a very simple thing. And he, and he kind of succinctly sums it up in verse 21 when he says, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. He said, I want Jesus to be magnified in my body. And if you've surrendered to Jesus and he's the Lord of your life, he's forgiven you of your sins and you're on your way to heaven, you want to live for God's glory. So what you want to do is you want to magnify or enlarge for others to see who Jesus is. In my life, I want the Lord to be magnified so that others will catch a glimpse of the enlarged vision of who Jesus is through my life. It's just like a magnifying glass. You know, if you put it up like this and it just, maybe you put it over text and all of a sudden these words are huge. But we bring that magnifying glass to the Lord Jesus and go, man, do you see how big Jesus is and how good he is? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Our prayers so often, anyway, for me personally, about our Sunday morning time is not that people leave Water Springs saying, wow, wasn't that a great worship song? Or not saying, wasn't that a great sermon? Our heart's desire is people leave here and go, man, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. And things can happen in certain ministry circles where other things are magnified. Other people are magnified, but I want you to know, we want Jesus to be magnified in our life and then at our death also. I, I want as big a crowd to hear about the love of Jesus at my death as I do during my life. Now, when you think this way, you see, living for the glory of God changes your perspective about life and death. Paul tells us what the mature attitude is, and in the rest of our time together, before we wrap things up, I want to encourage you in your own perspective on life and death. If you love Jesus, your desire should be to magnify him as your savior. Magnify him in the work that he's doing in your marriage. 
Magnify him in the work that he's doing in your children. Magnify him in your service to the Lord. Magnify him with your finances. In every dimension of your life, I want God to have the glory for my life. But when it comes to dying, a lot of people don't have a strong assurance or confidence about this issue in life. Now, don't you think we should have a pretty strong assurance and actually have reason through this whole process of dying? Aren't the statistics on death amazing? I mean, one for one, 10 for 10, 100 for 100. And yet I know people that go through life like this. I don't want to even think that day is never coming for me. I'm not, I don't even go to funerals because I hate to think about death. And it's like they're going through life with blinders on and they never want to, they never think that that day is going to happen to them. But statistically, you and I know it's coming for each of us. Unless we experience the rapture that First Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about where those who are alive and remain are caught up to be with the Lord. That's why we pray for it because wouldn't it be great to escape the whole death thing altogether. It's like, Lord, come before I die. It'd be awesome. Just, you know, we'll be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Nothing left on earth but smoke and shoes. So, but bar that, what's going to happen? I'm going to die. You're going to die. So thanks, Pastor. That's a real bummer this morning. No, it's not a bummer. It's reality, right? It's reality. But I'll meet a guy. He's 80 years old. I'm talking to this 80-year-old guy. He's telling me about his 30-year business plan. I'm looking at him. He's got one foot in the grave. He's got one on a banana peel, and he's telling me about his 30-year plan. Now, that's what I call optimism. He's planning to live to be 110. Probably not likely. I'm thinking, you better get the Jesus business plan. That's what you better get. Better figure, forget about Wall Street, man. You need to get right with the Lord. And people go through life, and literally, 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 they just want to ignore this day is ever going to happen. Somebody dies close to them, they don't know what to do with it. They're just freaked out by death. That's a normal part of life. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a season for everything under the sun. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed for man once to die and then face the judgment. And what he means by that is there's an appointment. And that's what the word literally, it's an appointment. Even you who are late are going to make that appointment. Because you won't be late for that one. You who are tardy and you don't know what a clock is, you don't know what a minute hand is, you don't know, you, never mind. So you're going to make that appointment. So what's he say to us about this whole issue? In verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. This is what Paul is talking about, the conflict in his soul, the frustration in his soul. He's at a place where he's arrested and he's going to stand before Caesar Nero. According to church history, Paul the Apostle, after he goes through his interview and has his hearing with Caesar Nero, he's released for a short period, then rearrested, brought back, and his head's chopped off. He's martyred for his faith in Christ. According to church history, we don't have that in Scripture. Acts 28 ends with him in his own rented house sharing the good news about Jesus. So, Paul the Apostle realizes this. He's in a situation, if Nero says, you're dead, it's over. And he said, I'm kind of excited about that. He said, I'm hard-pressed between this. I want to depart from planet Earth and go be with the Lord. To, I want to go be with the Lord. And we're not going to have a show of hands, but many of us who have been walking with the Lord a long time, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm ready to be with the Lord. Now, if you have a strong, rock-solid relationship with Jesus and a confidence and an assurance that his blood has washed away your sins and the Spirit of God has put his earnest money, so to speak, down on your life, you know you're going to heaven, Right? You're going to go to, one day you're going to die. You're going to breathe your last. Your heart's going to beat for the last time, and you're going to die. But Jesus said, though you die, yet you shall live. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. When I breathe my last breath, when my heart beats for the last time, when my pulse ceases and 
this body expires. This is not the real me. This is not the real you. The real you is not hardware. The real you is software, so to speak. Meaning that I'm going to put off this tent. The Bible says this is a tent. And I'm going to get a glorified body to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Just think about it. The last sigh. I'm with the Lord. I'm with the Lord. Now, I have to fill in that little detail, though. Because though many of us as Christians have a strong assurance that we're not afraid of death, that it holds people in the bondage of the fear of death their whole life. That's what Hebrews 2.14 says. The people are in the bondage of the fear of death their whole life till Jesus breaks that bondage. Having said that, I do not fear death. But I am not excited about the process of death. Those are two different things. The breathing my last, I'm with Jesus, hallelujah. How it happens, ah, uh, I don't know. I've been next to so many deathbed conversions. I've been next to so many people in ICU with tubes poking in them. I've been with families and we pray together and they unplug their loved one. I've been next to the bedside of both my grandmothers as they died of cancer that had riddled their body and I watched them become less than the people that they were before. Man, the process of death makes me a little nauseous. Makes me a little like, are you afraid to die, Rick? Absolutely not. Are you freaked out by the process? Absolutely. I don't like it at all, the process, you know. And the process, this is what I've discovered, that what would be easy for me to go or easy for you to go is harder on your family. And the harder way for me to go or the harder way for you to go is easier on your family. So the one is harder on the family. What I mean by that, if I die, say tonight I get in a car wreck. I'm going down the freeway, whatever, I hit some bridge, I'm dead. Boom, it was sudden and all my family's out a lot. They're like, oh, no, we didn't get the last hug, the last kiss. The, the family's kind of at a loss when it happens suddenly. It's hard on them. And even in the weeks and the months that come after that, they're just, there's that missing place. But that was easy for me. Isn't that the way you prefer to go? I want to go, boom. I want to go to sleep, not wake up. I, I want to have some, you know, train hit me, take me out. I want it to be instantaneous. I'm done. Not afraid of that. Take me. But that's harder on my family. It's harder on my family. But if I get cancer, I, get, I have nine months to live. And now I go through chemo, I do radiation, I lose my hair, I, I'm, through, I'm sick. I, you know, I've, I've just went through so many of these things with families. By the time the, the loved one finally is, expires, the whole family is finally relieved because it is so ugly. It is so heartbreaking. It is so, the person that you know and love and you watch them just become a skeleton right in front of you. They begin to talk in ways they would never talk before. They begin to act and as, you know, as their minds messed up and all that. It, it's heartbreaking. And when they go, you just finally go, oh, praise the Lord. Set them free, Lord. Set them free. Now, when Paul talks about being hard-pressed between these two things, he's talking about living for Christ or dying is gain. And I think that unless you really have some opportunities to face that in various ways, whether it's people close to you or in your own life, your heart will get put to the test. Your heart will get put to the test, whether you're ready to go or not. It might be that, that cancer scare you have or some situation in your life. You know, uh, Pastor Chuck Smith had a very odd person going to his church. And he was very odd and he had acted weird for months and he showed up on Pastor Chuck's door on a Saturday afternoon and knocked on his door at home. Chuck opened the door and here's this guy. And he goes, hey, Chuck, I, I want to talk to you out in my car. Chuck said, okay. So let me grab my jacket. He steps in and his wife whispers in her, honey, that guy scares me. I think he's dangerous. He, I, don't go with him. Don't go with him. And he goes, oh, honey, it'll be fine, you know. And he goes out there and he gets in the car. And when he sits down in the car, the guy's behind the driver's wheel and he pulls out a gun and he cocks it and he puts it right at his head. Pastor Chuck said, I looked down the barrel of his gun and he said, my first thought was, wow, my wife's a prophetess. That's amazing. (laughs) 
Same way with me. My wife's always ahead of the game. She knows things are going on. I'm never, I'm just oblivious to. But anyway, he points the gun at Pastor Chuck's head. And Pastor Chuck looked forward and he goes, well, praise the Lord. Here we go. And he just, he just kind of bowed his head. Like, this is it. And the guy uncocked his gun and he said, I just wanted you to know if you, you really believed what you've been preaching on Sundays. Not everybody's going to have that little test, are they, right? Hopefully not. But we have the test that goes this way. You know, for me, I had, I had a tumor growing in my hip for some time, some years ago. And the tumor continued to grow to where it was about the size of a small chicken egg. And, and I would bump it, and it would become really sore. And it was just like this, you know, thing rolling around in my hip. And I realized I had to do something about it on a Sunday morning because when we were at home, you know, I'm like, oh, this thing. And you could see it through my pants and stuff, and it would roll around. So my kids were little at the time. They are like, you know, seven, uh, five years old. And they would come up, you know, and they would like move this little thing away around. And so I'm, as a Sunday morning, I'm greeting people at the door. How are you? Welcome to Calvary Chapel. You know, going through that. And my kids come up with their Sunday school friends and go, check this out. <laughs> I'm like, Quit. We're not at home. You know, you're welcome. People are like, what are they doing to your hip there? I'm like, Never mind. And so I made an appointment to have the thing cut out of me. And so we were at the doctor and Tammy was in there with me. And the doc said he'll just, just cut it out. And I was conscious. He just used a, a local anesthetic. And as I was just sitting there quietly, I just said, you know, Lord, so much cancer in my family. My mom's had cancer. My sister's had cancer. My mom's brother died. He had three different types of cancer. My grandmother on both sides died of cancer. When you're around a lot of cancer, you just, you just start thinking, man, this stuff's like the plague. I was laying there, and uh, I was just quiet, and I said, Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity because here I am. And, and if this is cancer, if this is, if, I'm, if you're done with me, you know, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So if it's chemo, radiation, and I had told my wife before I went in, I said, hey, you know, honey, if I ever get a serious diagnosis of cancer, I don't know that I'll fight it kicking and screaming to the end because I watched so much life be lost through that. It's my ticket home. And so please, if that ever happens to me, I, I don't want to have to argue my way into just going home to be with the Lord. And as I prayed about that and I just submitted to the Lord, I was just overwhelmed with his peace. That in life and in death, Jesus is in charge of my life. He's in charge. Let me just ask you, is he in charge of your life? Are you in that place? Though you're not excited about the process, you're confident in the cure about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now, in that moment, I got done praying, and the doc gets this tumor out of my hip. There's a couple of things you don't want to hear the doc say. One is, oops. Uh, the other one is, he, in 20 years, I've never seen anything like this in my practice. Like, leave it to me. I don't want the new thing or the weird thing or the unique thing. But it's actually a tumor inside of a tumor. And they went and, and, and then they have that great waiting period. Now, we're going to send this off. And they're going to check out this, this tumor. And now you have five to ten days. You got five to ten days to wait, right? Tammy, Tammy cried, you know, whatever it was, five days, seven days, almost every day. I said, honey. It's win-win for me. She said, it's not win-win for me. <laughs> Why is that? Because he says here in verse 24, nevertheless to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and the joy of faith. You see, Paul realized if he does die, he's going to be with the Lord. That's gain. But as long as I'm filled with life, as long as I'm full of life, my goal is to be a blessing to other people. That's, that's what a person that wants to glorify God does. He wants to live for Jesus, and he wants to be a blessing to others. And I realize that in my own life, that it's good for me to be here for my wife, for my children, for my future grandchildren, for the congregation. It's good. It's good. God has a plan for every one of our life. Your life is one that bears importance and weight because God's created you and he's designed you. Even when you can't see all that God's doing in your life. You just got to trust him. Because I want to share with you, just as we're talking about life and death, that there are times that people are tempted by the devil who has come to steal, kill, and destroy, that you know what, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to take my life. You're going through an adversity, you're going through a trial, and you go, I'm just going to end this. And that's not your job. That's not your job. 
And it's the most self-centered thing you'll ever do. It will crush your family. Recently, I was reading about Ernest Hemingway, the famous fictional writer of the early 19th century. And his father killed himself. Then he killed himself. Then his sister killed herself. Unbelievable. It's like contagious. Because when the devil gets a foothold to lie to your mind, and you really believe that this world would be better off without you, realize it's a lie from the pit of hell and it's not true. There might be somebody in this room right now, you've been tempted with this. You've been thinking about it. You've actually played out the scenario in your mind. Don't you dare touch your life. The Lord gave you life and the Lord will take it when it's your appointment. But short of that appointment, you say, well, I'm afraid of the process. Yeah, we all are not excited about the process. Just join the club. Not excited about bedpans and hospital beds. and I'm not excited about any of that stuff. But God has not called me to determine the end of my life. He has determined the end of my life. I love what David said in Psalm 139. He said, all my days are written in your book. All, all my days are written in God's book. And he knows what the final chapter looks like. He knows what the final chapter looks like. Do you have a confidence that Jesus has forgiven you of your sins and that you conquered sin and death through his victory? You need to understand that just in your life with the Lord, these are not high spiritual platitudes or some kind of religious rhetoric. This is life and death for your soul. This is important for you to have that kind of confidence. Years ago, I got a phone call to go down to a, a I think it was Good Sam's in Blackfoot, a rest home. And uh, a granddaughter said, my grandmother passed away this morning. They resuscitated her. I think she was in her 80s, maybe 89 years old, something like that. My first thought was, why'd they resuscitate her? I mean, she's, she's sick and in bed. And, but they did. They resuscitated her. So I went down there, and the family was there. There's about five or six people in the room, and they were all LDS. And this granddaughter somehow knew me and invited me, but I didn't really know her, and I didn't know the family. And they said, this is our grandmother. And she was awake. She was conscious. Her eyes were open. She, and they said, but she can't talk. She, she's lost her ability to talk. And I said, well, can she understand me? She said, oh, yeah, she can understand everything perfectly. She just can't talk. And I said, well, that's going to be... First of all, when you get in this, uh, for me anyway, when I get in a confined space with people I don't know, and here's this whole situation, I was kind of a little nervous and a little funny about it. And I said, well, I, just, I guess I'm just going to go for it. God has me here for this moment. And so I went and sat down on a little gal, and I grabbed a hold of her little hand. And, and I, I said, so they say you re they resuscitated you this morning. And, and if you can understand me, just squeeze my hand. And so she said yes by squeezing my hand. And I said... You're really afraid to die, aren't you? And these big tears just began flowing down her face. And as the tears began to flow, I said, I, I want you to know that Jesus can forgive your sins and promise you an eternity in heaven so that you don't have to be afraid to die anymore. Would you like to ask Jesus into your life? And she squeezed my hand really hard. And I said, and normally I would, I'd lead you in a prayer and you would pray out loud, but you can't talk. And I said, so the Lord sees your mind. He sees your heart. He, he, knows, he knows what's going on inside of you. Do you want to ask Jesus in your heart so that you know when you do die, you're going to go to heaven? And she squeezed my, little, my hand really hard. And so I let her. Now, realize this. I'm talking with this woman, but I've got this unsaved family sitting you know, around me. So they're all eavesdropping on the whole moment. And, and so I said, I'm going to lead you in prayer. So I led her in prayer, and, and she just squeezed my hand all through the whole thing. And at the end of it, I said, Amen. And when I opened my eyes, she had these tears flooding down her face again, but now they were tears of joy. The smile on her face was just radiant. I said, you don't have to be afraid to die anymore. You're going to go be with Jesus. And he's forgiven you of your sins because he loves you, and he's preparing a place in the heaven for you. A couple of weeks later, she did pass away. And she, in, in that moment to me, I don't know why it's so powerfully imprinted on my brain. But here was this little helpless gal, couldn't even speak, that she was absolutely terrified of the last great enemy of her soul, the fear of death. And when she received Jesus, you could see that the fear was gone and the joy was there. And, and just that moment was so palpable. It was so dynamic. Now, the rest of the family was pretty quiet. 
they could all hear and talk and walk and everything else, but I don't know that any of them were in a place that they were really open to that because, you see, they weren't looking death in the face. And you might sit here today and you're kind of casual, yeah, whatever, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm going to live forever, and this death thing, and living for the glory of God, and whatever. And I've met people that they kind of have this attitude. I've heard about Jesus, I'll, I'll get right with him right before I die. Really, so you, you know when you're going to die. You just, you got that on the radar, like, oh, it's on the day planner, yeah, three weeks. Did you know? That you don't know that day? You don't know that day? And the Lord is calling to you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. He's calling to you. And he wants to invite you to live for his glory. And to have confidence in this life. And confidence that death doesn't freak you out. You're going to be with the Lord. Because you know today that you're right with him. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that by your spirit, you would do a work in our hearts and our lives in such a way, Lord, that it just brings us and draws us to your throne of grace. I ask that your spirit would move upon our hearts and our lives and you would just do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. As we're just in an attitude of prayer right now, I just want to invite you, if you're sitting here today and you've never opened your heart to experience the forgiveness that Jesus is offering you, to give you the confidence that you can conquer the fear of death. I just want to invite you to pray with me right now at the end of this service. In the quietness of your own seat, open your heart by faith and put your trust in the one that knows you better than you know yourself and the one that loves you and wants to forgive you. And if that's your heart's desire, I just want to invite you right now to, to pray with me. Just pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I realize you died on the cross for me. I realize you shed your blood for me to wash away my sins. And that you rose from the dead, Lord Jesus, three days later. And you're now, now at the right hand of the Father, ever living to intercede for me. I invite you to be the Lord of my life, Jesus. I invite the empowering of your Holy Spirit to give me the strength to live for you all my days. I'm tired of running from you, Jesus. I'm tired of resisting you. I'm tired of fighting against you. Today, Lord, I just open my heart and ask that you would take control and that you would help me live in a way that brings you glory in life and when that day comes in death. In Jesus' name, amen.